What happens in a self-sovereign model or a personal agency model is the bank is allowed to send the information no further than their client. It then becomes up to that client to determine with whom they share that information and what information they share. Zero party data, in summary, allows businesses to make informed decisions as they have done before whilst alleviating them of many, if not most in some cases, of the obligations under GDPR for the use of that data. Hello everyone, I am Sergio Maldonado and this is Masters of Privacy, a set of interviews covering the intersection of marketing, data, privacy and technology with a clear goal in mind which is redefining the relationship between people, brands and publishers around transparency and control. Which is to say, we're aiming for real customer centricity or if you will, human centricity. It may take us five years, ten years or more, but we're patient. We're enjoying the ride, pushing our ideas farther with every single one of our guests. Speaking of which, let's get on with the show. Okay, we have Julian Wilson with us today. Julian started working at Apple in the late 80s. He was a product guy and he was affiliated with the Advanced Technology Group at Apple. Uh, he worked on the forerunners of many of the things that we take for granted today. For example, the Newton, which many would say was the precursor to the iPhone. After that, he joined AT&T, and there he worked on what was the world's first anonymous mobile payment service using bank-issued digital cash, stored in smart cards as part of the NatWest and MasterCard Mondex trials. After a couple of other internet startups focusing on identity and data, he joined Barclays as the head of innovation, where along with a colleague, they submitted three global patents for modifications to the Bitcoin protocols describing ways to represent both fiat currencies and data globally. Julian left Barclays in July 2019 to join an open banking startup with a brief to build a self-sovereign data assertion service to represent bank verified data. And that led to this conversation, which we'll try and keep short and entertaining. I hope you will enjoy it. Julian, thanks for coming. Thank you for inviting me. Can I ask you to get started? What is Valido? Valido, in technical terms, is a zero knowledge proof based data assertion and verification engine. In human terms, we're going to allow people to assert things from a source we can rely upon without saying who they are. How connected is it to open banking? First of all, let's define for the audience what open banking is. Open banking is law, legislation. It requires banks to make access to the financial transaction networks available to non-banks. It is introduced in the UK first uh, uh, by the um, CMA, under the name CMA9, but is also closely linked to the European initiative PSD2. Many other countries around the world are looking at it, but uh, the UK today is um, the most advanced market for open banking access in the world. What Validoo does on top of that uh, financial data feed is to allow people to assert or prove anything which could be evidenced by a bank statement without saying who they are. I'm not sure. I mean, I would need to verify, but at least compared to Spain, I believe the UK has, has made a lot of progress when it comes to implementing uh, PSD2. Yes, I think it is reasonable to say that the UK is the most advanced market for open banking access in the world. Yeah, that's largely attributable, attributable to the government's vision in, in, in introducing legislation early, the CMA9, as we discussed. But I guess there's a lot of other factors as well. The, um, the government policed the, the law, you know, um, putting pressure on banks to be ready by deadlines. 
Um, and, and, and the banks responded favorably. A lot of them uh, set up incubators to help uh, uh, create new companies and, and, and understand the opportunities. We certainly did that at Barclays well, whilst I was there. That was one of my uh, roles. But other banks did so as well. Um, and as a result, I just saw some stats in, in preparation for our call. Over 300 companies have been created on the back of open banking uh, law. Apparently now there are over 2.5 million UK consumers uh, now using open banking products. That figure should hopefully increase next year when uh, the contract that we recently won at, a at Ecospend to facilitate open banking for the uh, HMRC tax submission, uh, that hopefully should educate the market and increase that number. Um, and the API calls, a good uh, measure of the technical interactions, that has gone up from 66 million in 2018 to just over 6 billion last year. So yes, the UK is uh, has embraced open banking and many other companies are taking it in different directions. Okay, good place to be then. And then, um, so what does, what does open banking have to do with personal agency, or in other words, because few people understand agency, and we keep talking about it here, with transparency and control and so on? Well, open banking, as we have discussed, is about access to financial transaction histories. And traditionally, these have been the sole domain between a bank and its customer. In fact, it's been one of the pillars of trust between banks and a customer, that only they and you can see their transaction. In a API model, what happens is the entire transaction history is provided to a third party, potentially jeopardizing that, that, that trust relationship. What happens in a self-sovereign model or a personal agency model is the bank is allowed to send the information no further than their client. It then becomes up to that client to determine with whom they share that information and what information they share. And don't forget, um, uh, what one of the things we will enable is for you to prove something without saying who you are. So arguably, I think the question uh, rests upon to what extent do people want to impose privacy or restrictions uh, on financial data? And I would argue that that's possibly one of the most sensitive types of information that people want to protect. In other words, it's an ideal candidate. Open banking data is an ideal candidate for treatment through the verifiable credential self-sovereign model. Yeah, in a way, you become the controller, not in a legal way, because there's always going to be someone that will ask. But I guess I don't want to overlap with decentralization, because I know that there's another debate, which is the architect architecture. But still, Valido does keep the data, right? Does allow me to host my data within Valido. Is that correct? I think the best way to answer this question for the audience is to bring the process to life. So the step one with the Valido credential assertion model is to activate the data asset wallet. Registration requires one piece of information only, and that's what we call a nickname. The idea is this is your digital mask, and so it shouldn't be something which could easily be correlated with your real identity. So um, not your social media names, not your email, etc. Um, and that's the only piece of information we need. We don't need your phone or email or uh, name or address. Once the wallet is active, the raw credentials and the private key, which um, f from which consents are granted, they are then both stored in the app. This, this could be cloud-based, but let's assume it's an app for now. At the point at which I want to uh, curate the value of these credentials, I'm taken to a list of data sources who could authenticate that. This, in open banking uh, terms, is a list of the supported banks. And clicking on one of those banks will uh, invoke the authentication process defined by the bank for its clients. So in the case of Barclays, where I bank, for example, I simply look at the phone. Once Barclays are satisfied that I am the beneficial owner of that account, in the background, they send us historical bank statement data, and we curate the values of the credentials in the handset. And once that process is done, the original data is deleted. So in summary, the only version of the data then exists in the credential values in the wallet. Very good. So that's a good example. Yeah. 
One other point I'd like to make on this process, Sergio, is what type of credential um, do we curate from this process? Um, the answer here is we have defined our own taxonomy of spend, if you like. It is quite closely linked to ONS data so that we can calculate relative values, but it's much simplified. And, and the reason for that is in the um, personal agency or self-sovereign model, it's I, the consumer, who have to understand what this information means. This isn't about detailed analytics or uh, uh, SKU level spend analysis. It's a broad brush um, categorization or taxonomy, which um, calculates things like my you know, current account turnover. How much do I spend on groceries or airline or mobile or, or, or um, uh, supermarkets? So these broad brush, high level uh, uh, taxonomy of spend and income are uh, calculated from the raw transaction data. And it is those things which the businesses will be able to request and subject to consent view. What's your view of zero party data in that context? So before we answer the question on zero party data, let's just remind ourselves what happens today. Businesses collect information about their customers and they do that to better serve them and to better target them and to acquire and retain them. And they do that when they collect that data, that's called first party data. Many businesses um, have traditionally bought data from other sources, social media companies, for example, and that is second and third party data. But uh, since the advent of GDPR, that Holding that data places a great deal of uh, a burden of responsibility upon those companies who use that data to comply with the laws governing that data's use. And these laws are, qu are, qu are quite onerous if you have the um, uh, title of data controller. Now, what Zero Party promises, the opportunity, is to give a business verifiable data points from which they can make the same informed decisions about retention, acquisition, eligibility, affordability, but without assuming the role of data controller. And that's precisely what we're doing here. Not only can we allow a business to see bank verified data points, we can also help inform things like propensity models. For example, um, even Google, with its millions of customer segments, usually puts us into groups of thousands. Now, with open banking-based uh, data points, we'll be able to say which ones of that within that group are more valuable than others. So I think, arguably, zero-party data, in summary, allows businesses to make informed decisions, as they have done before, whilst alleviating them of many if not most in some cases, of the obligations under GDPR for the use of that data. I see a lot of confusion in the in the market, but I wouldn't explore that one now, but yeah, between control, decentralization, again, who's a controller? And sometimes you decentralize, but you're still a controller because you decide on the purposes. And here it's people who decide on the purpose. So that's very powerful. It's really, really good. And and I agree. Sergio, in discussion about the architecture, let me say a few words about how Valido has been built. Sure, go ahead. So first of all, we spent a lot of time at the beginning working out what the right building blocks were or were likely to be. And we chose, uh, with confidence, to track the W3C standard for verifiable credentials. And we have built the services using open source protocols from Ares, Hyperledger and Sovereign. In addition to the uh, extensive technical foundations, what we also see in that initiative is a flexible commercial model and also um, an important attention to the governance model. Many of the supporters of those same building blocks have recently established a thing called the Trust Over IP Consortia. So whereas this is a permissioned public ledger, um, it has a well-established framework for governance and uh, those things are going to be increasingly important. If we want to um, advise a business that they can rely upon these data points uh, with confidence and, this, uh, and assert the provenance of the data, we need to have these things in place and these aren't the things a small company can build. But if you compare that, let's say, with the other initiatives out there that are purporting to address the same problem, the most common one, I guess, or the most uh, pop popular one is um, 
the uh, Sir Tim Berners-Lee's inrupt and solid approach. Uh, I, 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 I'm not a fan of the approach that they are taking. Uh, the idea that I should have all my data points pointing to a single unique reference identifier seems to me to fly in the face of what uh, we call the safe credentials. The principle that people should be able to reveal the minimal amount of information at any one point in time. Now that could be to reflect the fact that that's all I need to support that transaction, but it also could be to reflect the fact that we all have multiple identities uh, in our physical world life, but, uh, but, but especially so online. And many of these identities might be live at any one point in time. So I think that the approach being taken by um, individual control through discrete attribute is more consistent with allowing me to curate my holistic identity, but also a subset of individual, discrete, specific, bespoke identities, depending on what it is I'm doing and, 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 and who's asking the question. Uh, so, yeah, because I guess if you, we follow the, the, the logic of the pods and inwrap and, and so on, you're right. There's a tendency to have a single version of ourselves. So just putting it all together, um, personal data marketplaces, you mentioned that at some point in the past, you did ponder it. Uh, what would be your argument against a personal data marketplace, besides the fact that there's little money to be made? Yes, I'm sure there will be. But even though this has been spoken of now for probably two decades, I still think we are some way off, maybe five, maybe ten years. In part, I think the reason is, as I said earlier, that there are just simply insufficient numbers of people willing and able to pay for this. But also, uh, let's, let's look at this philosophically. For such a data marketplace to exist would require a conscious decision on the part of the consumer to productize themselves. And um, I think this is a degree of complexity and sophistication that the vast majority of people are not ready to adopt just yet. Um, rather, I think the early adoption of these techniques, and when I say these techniques, I mean personal agency or self-sovereign data assertion, adoption of these will be driven in the early days by convenience. In other words, it will be far easier for me to establish my eligibility for a loan or a mortgage or a, a tenancy agreement um, by authenticating myself to my bank and clicking one button saying, yes, you can look at these data points without actually asking me who I am and where I live yeah. or walk around and assert my value as a consumer to any business through any channel. Those things will be easier and more convenient, and I think that will drive adoption in the early days. Longer term, though, I haven't abandoned the, uh, the vision. Perhaps uh, in the future, AI and machine learning will uh, de-complicate a lot of those processes and make it more feasible. Yeah, very good. Julian, thank you very much. Thanks for joining us. Thank you for the invitation and, and your curiosity in this subject.